Okay. <clears throat> Let me see. We are live right now on YouTube. So good morning, Dr. Seifert. How are you? And it's a real, real honor to be with you. Oh, thank you very much, Carlos. It's a it's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your generosity and thank you for your work. I've been a follower of your work and for me it's a it's really amazing to have the, the chance and the opportunity to be talking with you and to be talking everything related with cancer. Something that people for, forget is that cancer right now is the second leading cause of death all over the world. Mm. And uh, it doesn't respect social class, uh, gender, uh, race, anything, country, anything. For how many years have you been studying cancer and what has been the increase of the rate of cancer that you've seen all over the years that you've been studying cancer? Yeah, well, uh, thank you very much uh, for that question. I, I, I've been actively investigating, well, let's put it this way, probably 45 years. Um, initially, um, the research was predominantly uh, asking uh, questions about biochemistry and, and, and uh, lipid biochemistry on cancer cells. It wasn't really, it wasn't really focused on developing a, a treatment protocol uh, when when I when I first looked into cancer, like er, like everyone else, we thought it was a genetic disease, and um, many of us were looking at different biomarkers and things like this. It wasn't until uh, nine, uh, about 2000, the year 2000, that uh, we started to consider uh, underlying causes of cancer and the actual mechanism by which tumor dysregulated cell growth was was occurring. And uh, that's when we linked up with what uh, Otto Warburg, uh, the German uh, uh, chemist, had had long long ago said that this is a uh, a disease of energy metabolism. And our own research uh, over these decades uh, has strongly supported uh, what Otto Warburg had originally described. And um, we br we we're, we're in the process of bringing the field of cancer back to its, where it should have rightfully been, which is that this is a metabolic disorder. And we have strong evidence supporting what Warburg said. And not only that, we have new evidence that Warburg did not know about that even more strongly supports the view that cancer is a metabolic disease. Once you, once you realize that, then the strategy uh, for managing the disease becomes far more different and less toxic than, than what we are currently doing. So, yeah, so we've been investigating all aspects of both the initiation, the origin, the management, and also the aspects of prevention. Because once you know the new theory that drives the, the, the research and actually underlies what the disease is, then, then there's going to be a, an enormous paradigm change. And death uh, from cancer will be significantly reduced uh, once, once the field uh, uh, understands what, what, what it really is. How much, I mean, people, the, I've been physicians saying that uh, the problem is that cancer hasn't been growing at all, that it's just being more diagnosed, that we have more tools for, for early diagnosis today, which is true. There are, there are tools for making an early diagnosis, but, but we haven't seen cancers in kids like we do now. We haven't seen cancers in, in adolescents and, or in young adults as we see today. What are your um, thoughts on Yeah, well, you know, that's, that's an important point. I, I think the, the uh, accumulation of toxins in the environment, the types of foods that we're eating, uh, you know, all of these things impact. There's not one single cause of cancer. As a matter of fact, I, I went through and identified all of the, the what we call uh, risk factors, okay? Um, there are many, many risk factors, um, mostly in the environment, diet, lifestyle issues, uh, rare inherited mutations. Uh, all, all of the risk factors that we have identified 
all in, impact one way or another on the function of the mitochondrion in the cytoplasm of the cell to generate energy metabolism. So whatever the risk factors happen to be, it's a chronic problem of energy metabolism. And, and I think that the environments uh, all around the world are becoming more contaminated with different things. So you have contaminants and you have diet and lifestyle issues. You have lack of exercise issues. You have all these different issues uh, all impacting uh, on different people, different ages, um, and different uh, cell populations, leading to what we now know is a, as you've already indicated, Carlos, it's a second leading cause of death. And in China, it already has surpassed heart disease uh, as, as the leading cause of death. Uh, when I was in Shanghai a couple of years ago, uh, I was told that we in China, there's 8,100 uh, people dying um, each day uh, from, from cancer. In the United States, it's over almost 1,700 people a day. It's six, 1,680 people a day dying from cancer in the United States. And, and I think, I think we, we have to look at, um, at, at the death. We, we have to look at numbers of people dying because that ultimately tells you uh, how we are doing in the war on cancer. How many people are dying from this disease? And the answer is it's increasing. It's not decreasing. It's increasing. Yes, there are more cases. And that might relate back to your question. Maybe we are diagnosing a lot more cancers. That's true. But we're also experiencing more death uh, from cancer. So uh, we're not, in other words, we're not making any major progress in reducing the number of deaths from cancer. Um, and that's why, you know, you can say, well, we're getting, we're diagnosing more. That's true. But we're also, yeah, we're seeing more, maybe due to improved diagnosis, but we're also seeing more deaths. So uh, it'd be one thing if we could diagnose better and reduce deaths, but we're not. And, um, and so why are all these folks dying? Uh, from cancer. And the and one of the major reasons is it's mis misunderstood as a genetic disease when it's not a genetic disease. So the therapies that people are using that you hear a lot about, immunotherapy, you know, targeted therapies. Targeting, what are you targeting? Uh, because obviously whatever you're targeting is not reducing the death rate. Um, and uh, once you realize that the tumor cells can't live without fermentation, uh, what drives fermentation? two fuels, glucose and the amino acid glutamine. How many hospitals are targeting glucose and glutamine simultaneously? They can't, the cancer cell cannot burn fatty acids or ketone bodies. How many, how many clinics around the world are transitioning their cancer patients to nutritional ketosis and then simultaneously targeting the two fuels that are known to drive the dysregulated growth? And the answer is no one. No one that we know of anywhere on the planet is targeting cancer and using can as, as a metabolic disease. So the, so the problem continues. The beat goes on. People are dying. That's amazing. It's fascinating how you how you make it so easy to understand. You you were saying that you pointed out uh, several risk factors that they all merge into the same ultimate condition, which is a lack of energy and mitochondrial production. Could you tell us which are those risk factors that you might, that people are, maybe don't know that, that, uh, in order to have a higher risk of, of getting cancer? Well, I think uh, right now, one of the biggest uh, risk factors is obesity. Um, obesity is linked to type 2 diabetes. O obesity is linked to systemic inflammation. Um, Systemic inflammation, chronic systemic inflammation uh, can damage energy metabolism in a certain population of cells in a certain organ. It can vary from one person uh, to another. But um, obesity has now replaced smoking as one of the top uh, risk factors uh, for cancer. Um, so you have that uh, um, you, you have chronic inflammation, intermittent hypoxia, uh, chemical carcinogens, exposure to chemical carcinogens, radiation, uh, viral infections, uh, hepat uh, papillomavirus, hepatitis viruses, these all damage mitochondria. And, and, and at the same time, you have several overlaps 
uh, aging populations, overlapping with obesity, with chronic inflammation, with hypoxia, all of these, all of these uh, provocative uh, secondary, uh, what we call secondary risk factors can impact uh, any one of which or together can increase the risk uh, of, of cancer. So you have to be um, aware of, 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 of the risk factors. And then once you know that all of these risk factors in some way or another compromise uh, ability of the, uh, of the cell to generate energy through respiration, breathing oxygen, essentially, um, you can then uh, institute uh, practices or approaches to try to improve uh, the function of respiration, which, which means that, you know, we, we talk about prevention. Unfortunately, most people, to be honest with you, most people don't care about prevention. Um, they come because they, they get cancer and now they want a treatment. Um, I know they said I should have done this and I should have done that to reduce my risk, but I have cancer now. What are you going to do for me? And, and when you see an obesity, worldwide obesity epidemic, it tells us that, the, that if, if people were really, really interested in reducing cancer, you would not have an obesity epidemic because people would fear obesity as a major risk factor for the development of cancer. But the fact that we have an obesity epidemic says that most people don't care or don't know. Um, so, so you have these particular issues. But we, I, we clearly know what causes cancer, and we clearly know how to manage cancer. The, pr the problem is it's not being instituted in any, any major hospital uh, anywhere. And that's the problem right there. And when you when you say this risk factors go and interfere with the mitochondria, so that people remember that the mitochondria is that part inside the cell when we one of the functions because it's not the only one where we produce energy when we take oxygen and glucose to produce energy in most of the most of the cases or the the easiest way for the cell to produce energy that the cell starts having a lack of of uh, energy production or a lack of, a, of the normal function of the mitochondria, how does it work? Those, all those risk factors go into the same pathway and, and at the end they, they produce exactly the same thing? Well, obviously, the, um, energetically, they're very similar. Uh, obviously, if, that, if, that risk, if those combinations or singular risk factor would, do, would, would uh, damage mitochondria in a liver cell or a colon cell or a lung cell, you would get dysregulated growth from the cells uh, of those tissues. If it were to happen in the glial population of the brain, you would get a dysregulated growth of the glial cells. Under the microscope, uh, they would look different from each other uh, because one is from the brain, one is from the lung, one is from the colon, one would be from the bladder. But if you look at them biochemically, they're all very, very similar to each other in that they're all struggling to get energy from uh, sources other than oxygen. So they, um, they ferment, they use, a, uh, they use the ancient pathway of fermentation. This is energy without oxygen. And, and how, do, how do we know that? Because we, Warburg and others, uh, we were able to take cancer cells and grow them in hypoxia without oxygen. Um, that's one of the unique things about cancer cells. They all can grow in the absence of oxygen. Not, none of us, can, can live in the absence of oxygen. And the best way to, to demonstrate that is we know the, the drug cyanide. And we know that people that would take cyanide to commit suicide die very, very quickly because they shut down the energy, oxidative energy metabolism in all cells of the body and the person dies real quick. Uh, you can pour cyanide on a tumor cell, it doesn't die at all. So uh, um, it lives, it can live in cyanide, it can live without oxygen. And this cuts across all the different kinds of tumors. We all know brain tumors, colon tumors, bladder tumors, breast tumors, they all can live in cyanide and without oxygen. So, so the question then is, is oh, wow, they're, they're living without oxygen. But you, you have to have energy. Without energy, nothing can grow. So where you say, where are these cancer cells getting their energy from if they don't use oxygen? And they're fermenting. How do you know they're fermenting? Well, they throw out lactic acid. You shouldn't be throwing out lact lactic acid. If you hold your breath long enough, you turn purple. Uh, your, your whole body starts burning lactic acid. You start dumping out lactic acid. So the cancer cell is dumping out lactic acid. Why? Because it can't respire. It cannot get energy effectively from oxygen. 
So the waste products of normal metabolism are CO2 and water. How do we know that? Every breath that I exhale, every breath that you exhale has CO2 and water moisture in there, okay? It's water and CO2 is the waste product of normal life. Cancer cells do not produce that. They produce lactic acid. They're producing, and succinic acid, another waste product. They're producing acidified uh, uh, acid molecules. Uh, this is because they cannot respire. So the waste products of fermentation are lactic acid and succinic acid, creating an acidified microenvironment. And, you know, um, so that auto automatically tells you what these cancer cells are doing. So how do you manage them? You take away the fuels that are there for fermentation. And those fuels that we have and others have identified are glucose, the sugar glucose, and the amino acid glutamine. In, in, in normal cells, you're 100% right, Carlos. That, that um, glucose is metabolized to pyruvate. Pyruvate enters the mitochondria and is fully oxidized to CO2 and water. The problem is the, the mitochondria in the tumor cell is broken. It doesn't work. So a lot of the pyruvate is, is uh, reduced to lactate, lactic acid, and it's dumped into the microenvironment. Some of it does enter the mitochondria, but it comes out as citrate for the synthesis of lipids, but it's not making energy. ATP is the currency of energy. Everything revolves on energy. Without energy, nothing can grow. So you have to say, how are these tumor cells getting their energy? They're using fermentation. They can get energy without oxygen. So that tells us now, that tells us clearly what's keeping these cells alive. So, and it's not that much of a reach to say if we take away glucose and transition the body to ketones, all the normal cells in our body can switch from glucose to ketone, not the cancer cell, because you, the, you need a good respiration to burn ketones. And fatty acids, cancer cells cannot burn fatty acids. They store them as lipid drops in the cytoplasm, clear indication that they're not burning fatty acids. So we know, what do they burn to stay alive? The sugar glucose and the amino acid glutamine. And those two fuels are the drivers of the dysregulated growth that we see. It's not that complicated. When you view cancer as a genetic disease, it is hopelessly complicated. Thousands and tens of thousands of different mutations, all kinds of signaling pathways are abnormal. So when you look at it in that, in that perspective, it's a hopelessly complicated disease. When you look at it as a metabolic, mitochondrial metabolic disease, it's far less complicated. So in this case, obviously, and it's been part of your work, you suggest that people start on a ketogenic diet or to start being in, in a ketogenic state, although you can, you can be in a ketogenic state by fasting or by exercising and fasting without being on a ketogenic diet. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, is there, I mean, if, 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 I, if I'm on a ketogenic diet, you say that when the body is on ketones, but or in a ketogenic diet or in a ketogenic state by fasting, that's a state in which uh, the tumor cells are not going to find any way of energy from glucose or from glutamine. So the first thing would be for that person even either to, if they're going to be in a ketogenic state or in ketosis by fasting or, or training or in a ketogenic diet to avoid completely glutamine they have to avoid completely glutamine? Is there a way in which, or, or try to eat low glutamine proteins or? No, no, that won't work. Uh, yeah, yeah, glutamine is, is the most abundant amino acid in our body. Um, it's the highest amino acid in the blood. Um, it's absolutely essential for the function of our immune system, the gut, the urea cycle. I mean, it's, a, it's an absolute uh, critical um, amino acid. Um, George Cahill, who ran the diabetes, the Jocelyn Diabetes Center, uh, fasted folks for um, more than uh, two weeks, two to three weeks. And then you began to see not only the glucose go way down and ketones go up, but the glutamine started to go down. But, you know, um, we need drugs and, and um, we, we, we have drugs that work really, really well uh, to target glutamine. Um, they have been used in the past, but like any tool, Uh, you really need to know how to use the tool that you have. If you try to target glutamine with a drug by itself, uh, you're not going to get the uh, outcome uh, th for several reasons. You need to target glucose and glutamine together. You can't target one 
uh, actually targeting glucose works a hell of a lot better than by itself than targeting glutamine by itself. But if you target both together, you get the real the massive benefit uh, from, from shutting down all the energy metabolism in the cancer cell, the majority of energy metabolism in the cancer cell. The issue, of course, with glutamine targeting, you, you, have, to, you have to appreciate the importance of glutamine for the gut and the immune system and uh, other systems. So that's why we developed the press pulse metabolic therapy where we press glucose down heavy. Body doesn't need glucose. We can switch to ketones. Uh, we can replace glucose with ketones. Glutamine is an essential for uh, a lot of things. So we can't hit glutamine too hard for too long. So what we do is we take drugs and we use them at a lower dosage and they really, really work well when the body is in nutritional ketosis. So that's why we developed the glucose ketone index calculator to allow cancer patients to know, regardless of what they eat, ketogenic diet, carnivore diet, Mediterranean diet, vegan diet, pescatarian diet, doesn't make any difference. If you can get your glucose down and your ketones up, then you can strategically use glutamine inhibitors, low doses, uh, dosage timing and scheduling variations to degrade slowly uh, the tumor without, without causing any collateral damage or secondary toxicity. And that's what we can achieve with, a with an appropriate understanding of using press pulse metabolic therapy. Uh, we've outlined, uh, we've outlined the, the, the strategy for doing this, the framework uh, for doing this, and now we are uh, investigating on an individual case-by-case -case basis uh, how these strategies might work. So once, once we uh, have achieved our better understanding of dosage timing and scheduling with glutamine targeting drugs, we can use any calorie restricted diet to bring the patient into nutritional ketosis and then strategically use glutamine, any number of glutamine inhibitors to uh, degrade slowly because the key is you wanna degrade and get rid of the tumor without causing collateral or secondary damage, pain uh, or anything like this to the cancer patient. So, uh, um, and we can achieve that a, a very, I wouldn't say it's, it's going to be super simple, but it's certainly not going to be that complex uh, that, because we've seen it happen in some people. I've seen, you know, some guy, check guy Tannenbaum. Now he did water only fasting. Water only fasting uh, produces tremendous stress on the tumor. Uh, I published a paper, it's called autolytic cannibalism. When you reduce the energy really low, the body is an efficient machine. All of the organs in our system are designed to work with each other. Uh, the, the body is, a, is an entire uh, integrated system. And when you start uh, restricting nutrients, making uh, energy efficiency absolutely essential for the survival of the whole, and then you find a population of cells uh, dysregulated in their growth, uh, wasting energy, not, not energy efficient, the body will turn on those cells and use them as food for the rest of the body. So once you can bring the body into a state of nutritional ketosis, low, low glucose ketone index, low doses of drugs, the body becomes super energy efficient and will attack the tumor. Uh, the drugs will be killing and they'll eat the tumor. The, your own body will dissolve and eat your own, the tumor for the good of the rest of the body. It's unbelievable. So, uh, um, uh, but you have to understand evolutionary biology and you have to understand systems physiology to understand what I'm, what I'm talking about. Um, but uh, the, these are the, these are the, the, the evidence is, is based on, on fundamental understanding of biological processes. We understand that. And we have seen these outcomes. And we know uh, that this is, this is the future. What I just described to you, if people want to stay alive and they want to be able to manage their cancer in a non-toxic way, and physicians would like to do this to treat their patients, they better start understanding what I'm saying, because this is going to be the future. Absolutely. And and there, there is something that I think it's very important for all the people that are, that are seeing this and is that you pointed it out, but we need to remember that we've been studying cancer for over 60 or 70 years with a lot of surgical procedures that sometimes most of them, sometimes they work with a lot of immunotherapy, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, which are amazing what, what they've done. We, we cannot say that it, that it hasn't done anything at all. But 
they haven't reduced debt, as you just pointed out, debt, which is what we're really looking into, in a big percentage. It's something mm -hmm. that it, it hasn't been that uh, effective as we, you know, as everyone would like. So there are most other things that we need to be addressing and prevention is something that is very important. And now that we're saying about prevention, in your work, I mean, you, you were saying that uh, being on a ketogenic diet really helps tumors to, to the body to get rid of the tumors or the, so they can uh, reduce. But is there a way in which I can use a ketogenic diet or being in, on ketogenic states by, by fasting, not being on a diet, but by getting in and out from ketosis by fasting in which they can help me prevent cancer? Is that being studied at any point or saying, look, if you go into ketosis for, I don't know, for two days, for a week, for a month, for, I don't know, has, has that been studied in something that people can do well, on a regular basis or do we need to yeah. be at a ketogenic diet forever? No, 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 no. I, I, you know, let, let's be, let's be honest. Um, you know, cancer was extremely rare in our, um, ancestral populations that those folks we call them aboriginal kinds of folks that live according to their traditional ways um cancer was extremely rare in, in those in those uh societies uh we know that from the work of um albert Schweitzer, the humanitarian physician who would study diseases in different primitive populations and he would report the near absence of cancer in certain groups of primitive uh, people's living according to their original traditional diets and lifestyles. Um, so were these folks in, in always in uh, ketosis and sometimes they were. So um, uh, in other words, if you, if you don't have many carbo uh, highly processed carbohydrates in your diet, if you're eating plants and meat and things like this, and only occasionally will you have uh, availability seasonal uh, fruits and things like this, you're mostly mostly in a state of semi-ketosis anyway. Our Paleolithic ancestors didn't have highly processed carbohydrates in their diet, so they were always in a, a state of ketosis of one form or another. Um, ketone bodies enhance the energy efficiency of the mitochondria. They protect the mitochondria from reactive oxygen uh, damage, oxidative stress. So, uh, so so cancer was rare, uh, very rare. And um, so, yeah, but I don't think today in our societies, uh, most people have access to highly processed carbohydrates. And they're less active today than we were uh, in the, certainly in the Paleolithic period. Uh, there were no automobiles. I mean, you needed to eat, you needed to kill, kill whatever you're going to be eating. Uh, you didn't have many chances to sit around, you know. Uh, we don't have fast food uh, uh, on every uh, on every corner in those early days of our existence on the planet. Uh, all of a sudden, within the last 50 years, uh, we've created an environment uh, that puts us at risk for all kinds of different cancers. And not only cancer. I mean, you got diabetes, you got cardiovascular disease, you got obesity, you got all these different chronic diseases that are exploding. Uh, on the population, but you, it's very difficult to get cancer if you maintain healthy mitochondria. So uh, uh, how do you do that? Okay. Periodic uh, intermittent fasting, exercise, um, eating diets that are uh, low in highly processed carbohydrates. And it's easy to say this, but it's not easy to do it uh, because the, many of the foods uh, that are highly processed have been engineered by food science and technology to taste mass very good. Most folks think these foods are very, very tasty. Um, and I don't care what nationality you are, uh, Chinese, Mexican, German, English, these foods are all very, very tasty that we have created. In the past, some of these kinds of things would only be seasonal during festi uh, festivals and things like this. Now they're available all the time and uh, exercise is being reduced. Um, and you can see it. Uh, all these chronic diseases are coming as the result of changes in diet and lifestyle. 
and uh, uh, exposure to chemicals in the environment. So uh, yeah, people have to know uh, to keep to prevent cancer, diabetes, and many of these other chronic diseases. You got to keep your mitochondria healthy. So you keep your mitochondria healthy, the probability of getting chronic disease is reduced. And you just said that for keeping the mitochondria healthy, intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating, exercise, and managing the foods that you eat are very important. Is there anything else that you would like to point out for people to know about any other strategy in order to, or, or a supplement maybe that they can use in order to have a healthy mitochondria? Well, you know, that's why we come back to the glucose ketone index. Um, it's a quantitative measure to know whether you're in therapeutic ketosis or not. So uh, they have the Keto Mojo meter. You can buy it from Amazon. They have, uh, you know, uh, free Libra now. You can patch something on your arm to measure glucose or something along these lines. Um, there's probably going to be ketone monitors coming out in the future. Uh, so you can take your cell phone and immediately see your glucose ketone index. And at least it allows people to know, um, you know, are they in a state of ketosis, uh, therapeutic ketosis, which is, a, a glucose ketone index of about 5.0 5 or below. But to kill cancer cells, you got to get down to 2.0 or below, and, and ideally 1.0 or below. And people say, well, what are you talking about? And I said, well, you got to get the meter and measure your blood levels of glucose and ketones so you know what, the, what zone you're in. And the other interesting thing is people say, well, can I eat this? Or how will I know if I'm in the zone? Well, measure it. And then you can find out what you can, can and what you cannot eat what supplements you can take and what supplement you should not take. People say, well, I'm taking this, I'm taking that. And I'm saying, what does it do to your glucose ketone index? They say, well, I never measured it. Well, how the hell do you know whether that's going to help you or not? Right? <laughs> so, I mean, it's not that complicated, right? I mean, you got the, the meter, right? Where's the meter? This thing, right? The meters. You, may, you buy the meter and, and you can uh, figure out your own G, GKI. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, so this is all something people can do. Then it takes the mystery uh, uh, out of what you're saying. So some guys say, oh, I'm a, I'm a vegetarian. I can't eat any meat. Oh, I don't care. Then see if you can get your GKI down to the same, the same level as the guy who eats meat. So, uh, uh, and, the, and the Mediterranean guys. I mean, we published a paper from a, a cancer patient with advanced lung cancer that metastasized to his brain and my colleague, uh, Dr. Athanasis Evangelio from Greece, uh, put this guy on a calorie-restricted Mediterranean diet, kept a low GKI, and the guy's alive now 10 years after. He should have been dead, he should have been dead 10 years ago, and he's still alive. So uh, brain cancer guys on carnivore diets. I mean, as long as you can keep a low GKI, you have a chance to manage or keep the tumor. I'm not even saying you can cure the cancer. All I can say is you can keep it in an indolent state uh, far longer. And that's another thing that people should realize. Everybody wants a cure for cancer. The idea is you got, yeah, it's great to have a cure, but it's also great to be able to live 10 or 20 years with the cancer, knowing that you have it. And that if you deviate too far from a, from a, a, a diet and lifestyle, you may allow that thing to grow back, but you can also keep it in an indolent state if you know what to do. And I've seen folks, I've spoken to folks that can actually watch their tumors grow faster as they take in glucose. And as they reduce the glucose, the damn tumor goes down again. It's almost like a, a thermometer. <laughs> it's like unbelievable. So uh, once people know about this, they, they can start uh, managing their own cancer with the, uh, uh, by themselves. They'll know what's going to make their tumor grow faster and what's not. You know, people say, well, I'm going to go to a party. Well, go to, after the party, come back and measure your GKI. And you'll be shocked. It's up around 50 or 60. And you go, and you got to try to keep, well, you got to get that thing back down again. But at least people know they have a, they have a, they have a, an ability to take charge uh, of their own existence. And that's one of the things about metabolic therapy. A lot, a lot of the approach falls on the shoulders of the patient themselves. They are ultimately responsible for their existence. And they, if they participate, they know what they're doing. They have a, a knowledgeable physician or healthcare provider that understands the concepts who can help and guide them along the path. Then you're going to be able to manage the majority of cancers without toxicity. Unfortunately, this information that I'm sharing with you is not known to the majority of either patients or their caregivers. Yeah. Yeah, we don't we don't get that information in medical school at all. And I don't I've been a physician for 
14 or 15 years. And uh, it, it hasn't been, but we, we didn't receive any of that information. And I bet you that they're not giving this information at all right now in any, any uh, medical training or any nutritionist or any, anyone else. It, it's, it's been fascinating what you're, what you're saying because you're not saying that being on a ketogenic diet or being on ketosis is going to cure cancer, which is maybe one of the things that people get on their minds and they just want it to evaporate. And I'm done and I'm back to being yeah. to party and being the same as I, as I was. Because we're always in a state of doctor, cure me of whatever I'm getting because it didn't have anything to do with my lifestyle and just cure me and do what you must and so I can go back, back in track, back, back to what I was doing before. It's very interesting what you're saying is that being on a ketogenic diet or being on, on chronic ketosis is going to help me have that tumor control or to shrink a little bit so it's in order to be controlled so it doesn't keep on growing and it doesn't it won't give me all of the complications or even give me metastasis if, if that's what we're looking for. Um, so does that mean that that person should be aiming to have a lifestyle to be to have an index under two, a glucose ketone index under two through most of their lives while they're on treatment? Is that something that people should be looking for? Well, or, or, in, yeah, no, I, I don't think so. Um, no, 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 when they have cancer, when they have cancer. Oh, if they have cancer. Well, they have you know, cancer. Yeah, I've seen I've seen a number of people. I mean, you can uh, I always say speak to Pablo Kelly, who came to me in 2014 with a glioblastoma and he took no radiation, chemo or or um, steroids or any any traditional thing. Uh, he had the tumor debulk three years after um, they said he was going to be dead in nine months if he didn't do anything. But he's, he's still alive nine years out. His tumor is still there in his brain. He's had two surgeries. Um, his diet and lifestyle keep a low GKI, uh, but not always. Uh, he, he, he occasionally, you know, flips back, uh, uh, up, but he understands that if he keeps his GKI high, high, his, uh, if, he, if it, if it goes up higher, he knows the tumor is going to grow and he's seen it twice already do that. So he's pretty become pretty conscious uh, of knowing what he has to do to stay in his own. Now, there are other folks uh, who really, you know, bit down on the water fasting and doing all these kinds of things, uh, keep getting a strong ketosis and, and carnivore eating without any carbohydrates and this kind of stuff. And they have achieved, uh, I, I don't know if it's resolution. The, they can't find the cancer anymore. Um, what does that mean? You know, people, people ask me, how do I know if I'm cured? And I said, well, if you die at 97 years old from heart disease, you probably were cured of your cancer. Um, and if you had cancer at 35 or 45 and you went on metabolic therapy and you died of old age and you ne the cancer never came back, then we would know you were, you were cured. But at any time, we don't know. It could come back in 10 years or 15 years and, and things like this, like it happens in, with traditional treatments. People say, oh, if it hasn't come back in five years, you're cured. But in six years, it comes back and, it's, and it kills you. Um, you know, what, what's going on with that? So I, I just think that there is a way to manage the uh, dysregulated cell growth is what the definition of cancer is. We know that the cancer ferments. It needs glucose and glutamine. So if we can, if we can deprive those fuels uh, to the cell, then they're not going to be able to grow very, very fast. Doesn't mean you get rid of it completely, but you're also taking a, something that was highly aggressive and potentially uh, life-threatening and bringing it back into a state of management. And I, and I think that when we talk about cancer, we talk about managing cancer. I don't talk about curing cancer. I talk about managing cancer. And I think if you can provide long-term management with a, higher with a high quality of life, Eh, what's wrong with that? You know, um, uh, people should know you, 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 they, they, there's ways to manage the, the, the disease. If it goes away completely, then feel good about it. 
and it, but it doesn't go away. You, at least you know how to control it. So uh, um, all of these things are new knowledge that people need to need to adjust uh, their their views on. What are the things that you've faced uh, more into having a rejection from the medical communities or from the traditional oncologists or traditional surgeons or all the traditional therapies from from cancer and uh, and what are the things that you think that we can do together in order to bring these strategies into into everyone's life, into the spotlight? Yeah. yeah, well, I think the biggest resistance it doesn't come against um, what I'm writing, the science. The science is solid. Um, so you're not going to get uh, that concepts to be attacked, like, oh, he doesn't know his sciences. We have different. We, we've gone through everything. We can't find a tumor cell that can survive without glucose and glutamine. Um, we, we've interrogated these tumor cells up and down. We've got preclinical evidence. The resistance comes when people hear what I'm saying, and then they read my published papers, open access in some of the major journals. And then they go to their oncologists and say, I would really like to do metabolic therapy. And the resistance comes from the oncologist saying, well, I never heard of that. How can it be right? If it were right, I would have heard about it in medical school. Uh, where, are the, where are the data from the clinical trials? I can't do anything unless the system tells me to do it. The American Medical Association never told me that metabolic therapy could replace uh, radiation or chemo. Until the medical establishment tells me, I can't do anything. I'm locked into doing standards of care. And if that was so correct, the medical establishment would tell me about that. And the medical establishment is not telling them about that. <laughs> and they're locked into doing, to doing what they're doing because they've been trained to do that. So you go up and down, the, the, the resistance is not against the science, it's against the practice, the practice of what, how we treat cancer patients. Um, you know, I'm not saying we don't do surgery. I think there's a, place for, there's a place for almost all the tools that we have in the tool chest. You just gotta know when to use them and, and the right way to use them. Surgeons can do a great job. They, surgeons can cure cancer, believe. If they get all of the tumor out of a person's body, that person could be effectively cured. The, the issue I have is that the surgeon needs to know that if we implement metabolic therapy up front, we can shrink the tumor down, sharpen the margins around these dysregulated growth, and the surgeon can feel more comfortable in knowing that he not didn't get 90% of it, he got 100% of it. So, uh, uh, But he needs to know that there's a way to improve the outcome that he does, not going in there like a bull in a china shop and starting chopping into this tumor, leading to fragments that could get into the bloodstream, leading to metastasis. No, no, you got to know what to do and how to do it. And, and, you know, surgeons are more concerned about the techniques they use to uh, debulk a uh, mass in somebody's body, not the biological systems physiology that they should also know about how to improve the outcome of their surgical procedures, which can then be greatly enhanced. And then uh, with radiation or chemo for, well, I think radiation could be used for certain types of situations where it's very hard to surgically debulk. But again, radiation could have a much greater therapeutic benefit if the tumor is shrunk and the inflammation is re reduced around the tumor, giving the opportunity for the beams to, to, to do a more thorough examination, I, 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 I elimination. And for brain cancer, I would never recommend, and I'm not a physician. I but I know that when you irradiate somebody's brain, invariably it makes it much worse. And I think most of the poor brain cancer patients are dying from the radiation therapy. So uh, they, that should stop. Um, but but uh, immunotherapies, chemotherapies, all of these things can be done in the right context. Uh, we're, we're finding when, a, when, a, when an individual is in therapeutic ketosis, the amounts of drugs, chemo drugs, can be reduced by by half, more than half, 25, 75% reduction in dose, and, and yet have and yet have much greater therapeutic efficacy even at the lower dosage. This means that you'll be able to eliminate the tumors with minimal toxicity because now you know how to put these tumor cells at a at a tremendous competitive uh, disadvantage. How they become now much more susceptible to the tools that we have. We're just not understanding the biology of the strategy for managing cancer. And I think that goes back to the training in the medical schools. These guys, these young physicians need to be trained to know how to, how to wield the power of, of metabolism to facilitate whatever they're doing. So uh, uh, whether they're managing type two diabetes, whether they're managing cardiovascular disease, all of these things can be improved 
if you can bring the patient into nutritional ketosis, shrink, reduce the inflammation, and then go after these, these tumors or, or, or conditions in a much more effective manner. And I think this has to be brought to the, to the, to the, to the medical profession. They need to know how to do this. Uh, otherwise, they're not going to achieve the outcomes that they would have, they would have wanted. And why do you think that the American Medical Association hasn't hasn't taken all of the all of your work into part of the saying? Wait, we need to change this. This mm -hmm. has got to change. We need to give strategies to physicians that are already in practice, and we need to give these strategies to physicians that are right now in medical school. Yeah. Because otherwise, it's going to be an endless loop. And then the group of physicians graduating saying, I, I haven't heard of it. I, mm -hmm. I have no clue what, what you're talking about. That must be quack, complete quackery mm -hmm. unless they go and check on the data. But sometimes your ego doesn't allow you to go and check on someone else's data. Yeah, no, you're 100% correct. I, I think it becomes a moral issue. Um, it, it's a moral issue. And if we have a strategy based on hard science and the evidence is clear, all you have to do is go back and look at what Otto Warburg did and what we're doing advancing what he's what he's already said and 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 the literature scientific literature is filled with papers showing that glucose and glutamine are driving these tumors i mean i mean we know what to do we should be able to do it so the question is why are we not doing it what what's the what's the the hold up and a lot of it has to do with um revenue generation i mean cancer is a multi-billion dollar industry um you know uh, hospitals make a lot of revenue on on uh, drugs and procedures and insurance companies. I mean, you're talking about a, a, a change for an entire industry. Um, and, you know, the status quo, it's always, it's always, um, you know, hard to change status quo. Everybody's comfortable except the cancer patients. But I can't tell you how many physicians have come to me uh, asking me to help them, either them or their loved ones in their families. Uh, clearly they're aware that whatever the system is giving them is not working. So, um, so they become, until you're the one on the end of the tumor, uh, you, you don't think much about what I'm saying. Um, and a lot of times these guys and the, the oncologists, they have so many patients, they don't oftentimes have, an, have enough time to go back and look at the literature and ask you know, whether they're doing the right thing or not. And if they were to administer a therapy not sanctioned by the American Medical Association or whatever association dictates what they should do, they could lose their license. So they're yeah. comfortable in doing what they're doing. And, uh, you know, so I, I think I think the most important thing, uh, the common guy on the street seems to understand this better than the, com the uh, or, or appreciate what I'm saying more than the person in, in the medical office. And uh, um, I, I think it has to be, a re-education on the part of both the patient, who now knows that they can play a major role in the management of their disease, and in the oncologist who can help the patient know what to do and when not, what not to do, and use the tools that we have available. So it's a re-education. Uh, but, but here's the situation. Um, uh, how, how long will it take? Because right now, we're, we're in our country, we're, sac we're sacrificing all of these poor folks uh, to horrific medieval procedures uh, because the system can't change. Um, and then we have to say, is this a moral issue? Is it, is it moral to continue to do something that doesn't work uh, based on a flawed theory of what the nature of the disease is? And we could actually achieve tremendous benefits if we were to understand the new theory of what cancer is and how to manage it. So, uh, you know, there's several firewalls that prevent this from happening. Uh, the biggest one is the information gap. Um, people not knowing that this is a mitochondrial metabolic disease driven by a fermentation metabolism. And there's a lot a person can do to, to help the physician, to help the guys in the, in the offices uh, manage the disease. Uh, and I, I think it just takes time uh, for this. But, you know, we're rock solid in what we know. We have the best preclinical model systems. I test all this. And then I have uh, physicians around the world in small clinics testing it on their patients. And the movie that's going to come out, the documentary movie called The Cancer Revolution, is now collecting more and more of these long-term so-called terminal cancer patients. And they're all there waving at you, smiling. Uh, and they all should have been dead. And they've all used metabolic therapy in one way or another. And for all of some of the most horrific types of stage four um, terminal cancers, clearly showing 
uh, that uh, these guys are doing well. And the current strategy of clinical trials, the way it's done for, in the drug pharmaceutical industry, does not work for metabolic therapy. In metabolic therapy, it's diets and drugs in combination. You can't do the kind of clinical trial that's being demanded by the, by the industry to test whether something is working or not. So you have to throw that out. You can't be using the uh, traditional clinical trial to determine if metabolic therapy is working because it's a combination of drugs and diets based on a, a GKI index, and that could fluctuate. So you have to constantly monitor this. The patient has to be a key participant in knowing how to manage their disease. This does not fit the shoe of the current clinical trials that we're doing. So we have to throw that out. We have to get rid of that, most of what that is. So that holds us back because a lot of folks will say, well, I can't do anything because I haven't seen the data from a clinical trial. And a lot of times, even if they see the data from a, from a partial trial, they don't want to believe it. So you have all kinds of, of things that are, are standing in the way of the paradigm change. And I think, I, I think it, it has to be, unless people are comfortable with sacrificing 1,600 people a day. If the society is comfortable with that, then, then, then things will remain unchanged. Have you performed clinical trials on, on ketogenic diets and, and the effect on... on no, we have, my colleagues have done in small, it's called metabolic chemotherapy, supported chemotherapy. I mean, we're, we're inch, inching our way forward uh, with this. And we published the papers. Uh, our, our colleagues from uh, Istanbul, Turkey, have published several papers on uh, uh, you know, stage four lung cancers. Uh, there are some papers on breast cancer. There are, there are some on brain cancer. Some of my colleagues are, are doing uh, the problem with the brain cancer, and that's what we're working on because glioblastoma is considered terminal for the majority of people. Uh, we don't think that has to be, you know. Um, well, the holdback is the main hospitals will not allow metabolic therapy to go through the IRB, the Institutional Review Board. Um, so what, what happens, see right now they'll do a standard of care followed by metabolic therapy. Um, uh, but they won't allow metabolic be therapy to be done without standard of care or put it this way, radiation. Uh, there's no, they have to radiate these poor folks. And I said, if you stop irradiating the brains of these folks, do metabolic therapy upfront, do surgical debulking, move back into metabolic therapy, you're going to get results that are unbelievable. They won't allow it. What will happen if they do that? And they, and they, they support what I'm saying. Uh, we've seen preliminary evidence to say that I'm right. It, we've seen evidence to say this is going to work. But it's, it's not done, oh, you have to have 40,000 people in a clinical trial. What are you, crazy? All, all you have to do is have a few people that should have been dead walking around telling people I'm alive. That should be yeah. motivation enough to say there should be something done. Yeah, it's, it's so sad that people say that this is anecdata. And it's mm -hmm. just anecdotes flowing around and some folks that, that, that I mean, uh, and so it's one of the arguments for people to say that whatever you're saying or any other scientist or, or you know, on any other topic, it's just anecdata. And it's the, the term that yeah, you use. Well, what, we what we have in, in brain cancer is uh, you cannot design experiments more conclusive for how fast people die from standard of care. I, I've looked at the data from all the survival curves around the world, and they're all overlapping beautifully. No one could design a better experiment for killing people than using the standard of care for managing brain cancer. So when they say, oh, the one guy, the five guys that do live much longer, it's anecdotal. You know, what we do know is what you're doing isn't working. And it's not only that not working, it's beautifully not working. So uh, uh, when are you going to get off that uh, kick and start changing the way you think about things? Uh, because the science supports what I'm saying, not what they're doing. Dr. Speaker, I have another question. It is something that is, has been taking my, my attention recently. I've been studying the role of, of high insulin levels and, and insulin resistance on, on all the metabolic conditions and all the metabolic diseases and everything else, and diabetes and obesity and polycystic ovarian syndrome and whatever. But it has caught my attention, the role of insulin as a growth factor, which is, we already know that it, it is a growth factor. But what's the role with everything that you're mentioning and that you've said before, what's the role of insulin that we already know that it's very important as a growth factor for several cancers, such as most of the most common as colon cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, ovarian cancer? 
what's the role on insulin on your theory on and all on the things that you've found yeah well you have to say what what does insulin respond to well, like sugar. yeah so you take insulin go you, you take sugar down insulin goes down a tumor yeah, cell, yeah. A tumor no, cell it's just, yeah. just to bring information for people yeah uh, uh, tumor cell does not eat insulin uh, insulin yeah. is a uh, the, the uh, insulin is a facilitator for glucose metabolism so yeah. uh, tumor eat will eat glucose so uh, um, insulin facilitates glucose metabolism um, so clearly if I lower my blood sugar down that's what happens when you when you um, do water only fasting you know after about seven to 12 days I mean insulin levels are really really low uh, because glucose is really really low um, so clearly insulin uh, in in most people under normal physiological conditions responds to blood sugar. And then you, uh, as insulin goes down, uh, a glucagon, uh, the other hormone, the, the balancing hormone goes up and you, and you mobilize fats out of your, out of your adipose tissue and they get mobilized, brought to the liver and the liver makes ketone bodies out of it. And then the brain starts burning ketone bodies. So, and insulin levels are low. Um, and gluconeogenesis is a process by which we start to metabolize uh, fatty uh, triglyceride backbone, glycerol backbones, and certain uh, um, amino acids can be made into glucose in the liver. But this is an energy uh, requiring process. So uh, you 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 burn energy to get energy, and you get a new homeostatic state, metabolic homeostasis. Insulin is in low conditions. So yeah, I mean, in a lot of those cases, diabetes, cancer, and all these blood sugar is high, insulin is high. So insulin is driving the sugar into the tumor cells. Uh, and, and, and into this it, it, general enhancing metabolic uh, activity. So, so um, you know, I look at when you do water fasting and you do keep your GKI down, we clearly show that the glucose ketone index is linked to the lower insulin levels as well. So uh, um, the glucose goes down, the insulin goes down. We published a nice paper on this, looking at different diet effects in mice under different fully fed conditions under calorie restricted conditions. And clearly, when calorie restriction, whatever you're eating, whether it's a high fat diet, high protein diet, that everything, insulin and glucose all go down under the restricted conditions. So, uh, um, uh, you know, it's all it's all linked to the, the global physiological system. Dr. Seafried, um, this has been amazing. I'm, I really, really admire your, your work and, and thank you for your time. Uh, I want to ask you one last question or one last message. We have thousands of people looking at what, what you're saying, and I think that your research and your work and all the data that, it, that it's all the clinical data that it's out there really needs to be heard by, by practitioners, by people, by everyone knowing, and it's the only way in which we can uh, shift this to be approved by all the medical associations all over the world, because it really needs to be approved. What would be, a message that you could, knowing that cancer is the second leading cause of death all over the world, and you just pointed out that China is number one. What would be that final message for people? Because we, everyone thinks that cancer comes up from nowhere. And people really, they want to know that, that, that tool hidden on the holy grail that they're going to find in order to prevent and to, in order to have a good prevention and a good treatment for cancer. We, we've, you've said it all over the video, but just to make it a final, like a short message, what would be that that you would like to give people in order for them to know how to prevent and how to have a good treatment for cancer? Well, I, I think um, prevention, of course, we, we know what we need to do. Uh, you know, reduce our exposure to um, highly processed carbohydrate foods, toxic environments, of course, bad water, bad air, and all this, um, where toxins can enter our body from a variety of different of, of, uh, you know, diseases and things like this. But yeah, but, but as I said, it's hard. Um, as I said, I, I don't think most people, I think if they knew the risk factors for cancer and why and how, they might do a better job at trying to avoid this. I think I think governments could do a better job in in advertising. Uh, they did a really good job on advertising how bad cigarettes were for people, and um, and smoking, of course, went way way down uh, as a result of that. And um, 
uh, I think they could probably do the same thing, but you have to be careful because you're 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 st you're touching the toes of a of large industries, food industries, and these kinds of things, where they're making billions and billions of dollars on selling uh, highly processed carbohydrate foods, and the federal government now would come out and say, no, it might not be a good idea to eat too much of this stuff, and then you get everybody angry at you. Uh, the, the industries that are supporting the politicians, <laughs> all of a sudden, uh, the government again can't say anything because they're kind of uh, uh, chokehold by the, by the industry. Um, but but uh, at least they, they should have some uh, recognition. I mean, they put, they put uh, a warning on a, on a can of beer uh, telling you that it could harm you. Uh, they put a warning on a pack of cigarettes. Um, they could put a warning on a uh, on, on certain highly processed foods, uh, they could certainly do that, or at least bring awareness to the problem that what we that we know. As far as far as managing cancer, we know now that it's a metabolic disease. That alone allows the cancer patient uh, to recognize that they become an active participant in the management of their disease. They don't. They don't. Uh, and that's another really important issue. I can't tell you how many cancer patients would love to be doing something to help uh, rather than just sitting there and being infused with a toxic chemical or having some part of their body targeted with a radiation beam. They, they, they want to they pay, play a role in the management of their disease and metabolic therapy provides that, that activity for them. So uh, again, it's, it's just simply education, getting the word out, having people know that there are options to what, what we're currently doing and that the outcomes could be massively improved uh, as the result of this. So um, we're working hard to do this. I keep publishing papers again and again. Uh, I have to convince my scientist colleagues uh, with hard, really hard evidence that, uh, that goes into the metabolic mud of the problem, uh, the detailed biochemistry of what, of what we need to show uh, in the scientific community, which they're demanding to, to have that information, uh, mechanisms of action. Uh, that I have to do, and I am doing it. Uh, but then there's the practicality of, you know, how do we take all this science and bring it into the clinic and having it improve the outcome of a patient? That's where I work with clinicians uh, on, on this aspect of it. And uh, we just keep publishing case reports of these so-called terminal cancer patients uh, uh, and show that they're doing fine. We published a big one on breast cancer. We did one on lung cancer. We did one on brain cancer. And we're doing more and more of these. And it works in dogs too. I, I published a big paper on, on mast cell cancer resolved in a dog using metabolic therapy. So uh, uh, clearly uh, this stuff works if you do it the right way. And I think people should be encouraged. Uh, there's hope. Uh, there, there's a light at the end of this tunnel. I, I just don't know how long we have to walk in the dark before we get to the light. <laughs> so it just takes time. <laughs> anyway, that, that's where it is. One final question. Uh, something I forgot to ask you at the very beginning. Some people say that um, toxins have nothing to do with cancer because when you're eating artificial sweeteners, artificial colors, artificial uh, flavors, when you're eating uh, TBHAQ, which comes from petroleum to make it as an as a antioxidant or BHA or BHT and all these chemicals, that it's only related with the dose, as as uh, the old toxicology from Paracelsus is saying that the poison is in the dose, and it's saying, well, I think that the toxin, the toxicity, is in the dose, and on the frequency, because you can you can eat something at a very low dose and make it a, a, a high frequency, and it's going to eventually become something uh, potentially uh, dangerous. You've said that cancer is a metabolic disease. But do you think that there are toxins that really could lead into a, a cell to start uh, turning into a cancer cell and then becoming uh, something that has a metabolic disease and all of the effects that you've just pointed out? But maybe the, the, the cause of the, or the initial cause for that cell to turn into a cancer cell could be a toxin? What we have, what we have shown and what Warburg had clearly shown I'm getting back to your dosage, dosage issue. If the dose of the toxin is too high, it kills the cell. Um, and you can never get a cancer cell from a dead cell. 
So it, it's a cumulative low doses uh, of, a, of a provocative toxin that would damage the ability of the cell to generate energy through oxidative phosphorylation. You have to realize that the control of the cell cycle and the growth of the cell resides in the mitochondria itself. So that's the organelle that allows the cell to maintain a differentiated state, a quiescent state, doing this, what the cell would normally uh, have been designed uh, through evolutionary processes to do. When that, when that organelle becomes chronically disrupted by any kind of a toxin. And when you look at what toxins do, you can look at the mitochondria and you see them biofluoresce. They, they, they fluoresce. So toxins get actually into the mitochondria chronically. As I said, if it's too acute, you'll kill the cell. It's got to be a chronic assault on the energy metabolism of that cell where the cell gradually loses the ability to maintain the metabolic homeostasis, causing the cell. Now, here's an interesting point. Only cells that can switch from gradually transition, gradually transition, from respiration to fermentation, can become a cancer cell. We rarely, if ever, get cancer in neurons of the brain. Neurons of the brain can't transition to fermentation. We rarely, if ever, get cancer cells in cardiac myocytes, heart cells. They, don't, they can't make the transition to a fermentation metabolism. So it becomes clear only cells that can transition from respiration to fermentation can become dysregulated cancer cells. So we already know that it's all related to the energy metabolism. So um, yeah, so it's dosage for sure, but it's gotta be chronic, it can't be acute. And, there are, and the nuclear mitochondrial transfer experiments clearly show that it cannot be, it is not a nuclear driven process. It's a mitochondrial driven process. In other words, the cytoplasm, not the nucleus, is responsible for the dysregulated growth. Dr. Seabree, thank you so much. This has been absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your generosity. And thank you for your work. Your work has been thank you. inspiring thousands of people, th thousands of physicians such as myself. I loved your book when, when I read it, and I've, I've loved every single one of your papers, which I've tried to, to read them all. And, and please continue with your work. And if there is anything, anything at all that I can do and with it, and then that it's within my powers to... Well, you can, you can notify people that um, the, 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 our work is supported from largely from philanthropy and private foundations. And the uh, Travis Christofferson's Foundation for Cancer Metabolic uh, Therapy supports our work. So people, people if they feel they want to be part of the movement, the change uh, that's coming, uh, they can... Uh, some folks, you know, they're not interested in making a billion dollars on some new thing. They just want to know that they've contributed to a paradigm shift and that alone makes them feel better about their own life. Um, and we, and we're very open and appreciative of all of those who, who support our work and we acknowledge them in the scientific papers. We, when we publish papers, we acknowledge folks uh, who've contributed to our research and, and that, that in itself is a reward uh, for those folks that want to support what we do. So it's happening. Uh, more and more people are coming on board with this. And we thank them, uh, and thank you for for having me on your on your program today. Thank you, Dr. Seaprin. And if you can share with us, uh, maybe a link that we can maybe leave it here on the comments afterwards. Uh, maybe during the day we can leave it here so people can go, and if they want to support your work and uh, and all of your team, so they can do it, and so we can have this all this information and all this knowledge and all this science uh, helping. Uh, the second leading cause of death, which is cancer. So thank you so much. Yeah, um, thank you. Wish you a wonderful rest of your week and I uh, hope you, I'll see you again. Yeah, thank you very much, Carlos. Nice being here. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.